All right. Now, let's uh, take our Bibles and let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. We're continuing our series on the churches, the seven churches of Revelation. And now we're up to the, the, uh, the, the fifth church. It's the fifth church, the church in Sardis. The fifth church, the church in Sardis. So let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis writes, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Jesus Christ says to this church in Sardis, you're dead. This is a dead church, okay? Now, before we get into the dead church of Sardis, something I want you to notice there in verse number one, speaking of Christ, it says that he hath the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God. Now, the, these seven spirits are mentioned uh, a few times here in the book of Revelation. So let's just try to understand a little bit about what these seven spirits are. Go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. So just one chapter across. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Let's just look at the references to these seven spirits. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. The Bible says, And out of the throne, so this is the throne in heaven, the throne of God, out of the throne proceed of lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So before the throne of God, we see these seven spirits of God are there, and they're burning like a lamp of fire. Right, before the throne, okay? Now, as we keep reading this, what I want to say to you, what I believe the seven spirits are, is that it is all seven make up who the Holy Spirit is. That's what I believe. I believe we're looking here at the Holy Spirit being manifested there before the throne of God. And of course, if you know your Bibles, many times the number seven is the number of completion or the number of perfection. And so there are sort of, from the Holy Spirit, there are sort of seven attributes of his spirit that plays a role here but the first thing we notice that it's before the throne of god he's there in heaven go to revelation chapter 5 now revelation chapter 5 verse 6 revelation chapter 5 verse 6 the bible says and beheld and i beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain so we see the lamb who's the lamb of god that's jesus christ and he appears there before the throne as it had been slain and I think the significance there is that, of course, Jesus Christ in his resurrected body, even though he was in his resurrected body, remember when he, when he presented himself to the disciples, he still had the handprints. He still had you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the hole on his side. And so what I, what I believe you know, uh, is that in, in the future, in the eternal heavens, the new heavens and the new earth, that we're always going to have this constant reminder of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We get given resurrected bodies through the power of, of God, but we're not going to show up with our scars and our, and our, you know, our, our, uh, you know, our, our sicknesses. We're going to have these perfect bodies. But one thing I, I see with Jesus Christ is He's always going to have those marks of His sacrifice, of His offering, just as that eternal reminder of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So there, there, you know, a, a lamb stood as it had been slain. Look at this, and of course, this is this is figurative or symbolic of this lamb. It says here, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Okay, It's quite interesting that you know, Christ you know, spoke in, to, the, to, to the church in Sardis that he has the seven spirits. And here, as a, as a picture, or as an image, we see this lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits there of God as well. And of course, you know, when the Bible speaks of, of, a, of, of um, horns, it's often about authority. You know, someone, uh, you know, often, you know, uh, say David speaks about, you know, the Lord exalting his, you know, horn or things like this. And it's a picture of authority. So these seven spirits have a high authority. In fact, it's the same authority that comes from Jesus Christ because it's Christ that has these seven spirits there. Um, and also when it says uh, not just the, the horns, but seven eyes, okay? So the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, right? The eyes of the Lord, you know, sees all things. And so what I see there is that the Holy Spirit, you know, does go out throughout the earth and is working in the hearts of men. You know, the Holy Spirit sees these things. He has the authority. He has the insight of God and is there before the throne. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. 
because we don't really have much more about these seven spirits. We, we know about the Holy Spirit, okay? And Isaiah chapter 11 is the, the best, and I, I believe it's, it's correct to say this is where we, under, we, we see what these seven spirits represent, okay? These seven spirits, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, and look at this, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now if you know who Jesse was, that was the father of King David, okay? And this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, that he would come from this family, from the lineage of Jesse, from King David. Of course, we know that you know, Jesus Christ sometimes there is referred to as a branch, you know, and, uh, and like, you know, roots and things like that. Look at verse number two. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, okay? Rest upon Jesus Christ. And uh, so I want you to just notice, just there in verse number two, we have all mentions of the seven spirits there. It says, and the Spirit of the Lord, okay? So he, the Spirit there represents the Lord God. Then it says, the, shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, okay? And understanding, that's the third. The Spirit of counsel, the fourth. And might, the fifth. The Spirit of knowledge, the sixth. And the Spirit, sorry, and of the fear of God. So we have there seven attributes of this Spirit that came upon the Lord Jesus Christ when He came onto this earth. Look at verse number three. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, again speaking of Jesus, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked." Now, if you remember this, uh, some previous church there where Christ spoke about having the, the double-edged sword that would come out of his mouth and that he would destroy the enemies, he would destroy the armies of the Antichrist. And we kind of get that picture there in verse number four, that he has this rod that comes out of his mouth and just by the breath of his lips is he able to slay the wicked. So it kind of gives us an idea. It just sounds like, from what I can gather, just Jesus speaks the word of God. You know, and, and through his power, he's able to destroy the enemies there. But you can see how this speaks of Christ and how it speaks about that spirit of the Lord coming upon him and all these attributes that are associated, you know, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of, of knowledge. And I, I believe these are all attributes that come from the Holy Spirit. You know, if you need a counselor, who should you go to? There's a spirit of counsel here, spirit of counsel. If you need guidance, if you need help, you need direction, you ought to take that to the Lord God. You know, He's your counselor and, and might. You know, He'll strengthen you in the need of, you know, time of counsel. You know, sometimes people desire the first thought when they need counsel. You know, I need to go to the counselor. I need to go to the psychiatrist. Or I need to go to this whatever. You know, I need to go to whatever to somebody to help me. But no, we should be going to the Lord God. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is our counselor as well. You know, He will guide us. He will give us strength. You know, the Bible says wisdom, understanding, knowledge. We all need these things. You know, we need the presence of the Lord upon us just as Christ had received it from the Holy Ghost and the fear of the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is going to help you walk in His path. If you don't have a fear of the Lord, you're, not, you're just going to walk in the ways you want. You know, you're going to you know, commit sin. You're going to walk in, in, in darkness without considering, you know, the chastisement of the Lord or the judgment of God that would come upon you. So one thing we, I, I think about, when I think about the, the Trinity, you know, obviously we know that God the Father you know, has the highest authority. We know that the will of, of, of Jesus Christ is aligned with the will of the Father. You know, it, it, God the Father gives works for the Son to do. And the Son is the one who carries out those works. But the Bible is also very clear that He, do, he carries out the works by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is upon Jesus Christ. It's interesting how the, how the, how the Trinity operates. You know, the, the Father makes the call. The Son, uh, you know, carries it out but he carries it out through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, just, uh, just to remind you this, it said there that the Spirit of the Lord had come upon Jesus, and this is the seven spirits here, or the seven attributes of, of the Spirit here that we see. If you guys can go to Luke chapter 4 now, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And of course, we've gone through the book of Luke already, but just as a reminder here, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Remember back in Isaiah, it said that the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, it said that he would judge the poor, uh, reprove the, with 
uh, equity for the meek of the earth. So, you know, the Lord's concern for the poor, for the meek. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he had found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So there's that, that Spirit of the Lord that's upon him. Because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. There he is, concerned for those that are poor in spirit. That he have sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Okay, So it's interesting here that we have Jesus Christ in his first coming. The Spirit of the Lord God was upon him. Okay, The reason why he grew in wisdom and stature and understanding was the Holy Spirit was working through the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. You know, And when we looked at Isaiah, it's not just that. Now, you know, the same Spirit you know, that, that, that caused Jesus Christ to have that, that Spirit of meekness and, and wisdom and all those kinds of things is the same Spirit that empowers the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming to just speak the words and destroy the enemies you know and uh what i what i like about this is again jesus christ came and he set an example for us he came in the form of you know flesh and 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 you know he, he you know he, we're called to walk after his steps and as i read about here the, the seven spirits and how the holy spirit was upon christ just reminds me about our need to be with the spirit you know if you've been saved you've been born of the spirit you have the new man but we ought to be people that are seeking to be filled by the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if you need boldness, you need wisdom, you need understanding, you need to ask the Lord to give you a greater measure of His Spirit, of His power, you know, of wisdom and knowledge. And those things come from the Holy Spirit. You know, quite often we don't think about too much, we don't think too much about the Holy Spirit, but that's where the power of, the, of God lies. And that's, you know, that, that's, what, that's who the Lord uses to, to work through us, to, to get us to a point where we can serve Him and, and walk after His ways. And so let's go back to Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3. Now that we have a better understanding of what those seven spirits are, it's not, I, I don't see it as seven holy spirits, but rather attributes, seven attributes or a perfect completion of who the Holy Spirit is and, and working through those different uh, channels, I suppose. Um, and then it says here in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, sorry, verse 1, it says here, you know, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, we already covered what the seven stars are, they're the seven pastors or the seven messengers of the church. He says, I know thy works. So this church in Sardis was a working church. They were serving the Lord, right? They were doing the works. Then he says this, that thou hast a name that thou livest. He says, look, you've got a good name. Your church is well known. It has a good reputation. But then he says, and art dead. He goes, but you're a dead church. You see, this church in Sardis had started well, right? They were serving the Lord. They were doing the works. They had developed a good reputation. But now, where they, where they were, they had become a dead church. And they were trying to live off their former works. They were trying to live off their former reputation. This church had gone bad. This church is now dead in the eyes of the Lord. All right? And uh, let's look at verse number two. Look at verse number two. Now, even though in the eyes of Christ this is a dead church, we see that in his patience, in, in the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? In his mercy, he's still able to find some good things about this church, okay? Some good things, and he wants this church to be resurrected, to come back to life, to go back to the way they used to be. And verse number two, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. He goes, There's still a few things in this church, even though you're dead. There's still a few little things. That's good. You're doing right. A few things. Strengthen those things. All right? Because look, he goes, uh, what do you say? Verse number, oh, he goes, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He goes, those little few things that you're still doing good, they're almost dead. You're almost completely dead, but you still have a few little things. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the Lord here, right? Because churches are made up of fallen human beings. You know, and sometimes, we, you know, I, I don't know, I never want to be to get to a point where Jesus says about our church is a dead church. But, you know, you can be in a really dead church, a really bad church, 
And what I'm encouraged here is that even the small things that are still being done you know, for the service of God, just the small works that are being done, Jesus Christ looks at that and goes, well, strengthen those. You, know, you can still fix things. You still have a little bit of life in you. You can still be resurrected there. You know? And I, I love that about Jesus Christ. You know, he's not quick to, to cast away a church. He's still able to see those small things, even though those small things are close to death as well. And then he says in verse number two, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse three, remember therefore how thou hast received, sorry, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. All right, this dead church, you know, Jesus Christ is not just looking to cast away the candlestick. He wants them to repent. He wants them to remember. Let's look, remember, you know, the things that you've received and heard. It sounds like to me, this church once had a good preacher. It sounds like they had, a, they had good preaching, a good pastor there one day, right? They've, they've heard, they've received the words of God. They were being motivated to do the works. They were well known. Maybe there was a generational shift. Maybe there was a new pastor that stepped in, you know? Someone that wasn't, you know, on the same page as the former preacher. You know, someone else stepped in and now they had died away. You know, they, they'd become complacent. They'd started compromising as a church. The things that they once heard, they, they, they've now forgotten those things. And God says, Jesus Christ says, remember those things. Go back to those old things that you once heard. Repent, you know. And then he says this at the end of it, at the end of repent. He goes, if therefore thou shalt not watch, were they watching? He says, you're not watching. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not, not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now this is why I asked Brother Sam to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because when you look at these words that was a set of Sardis, you know, watch, a thief, the hour I come upon thee. Doesn't this remind you of the rapture? Doesn't this remind you of the teaching of the rapture? And, uh, you know, we're called, when it comes to the end times, when it comes to the resurrection of the saints, we're called to be watchful and to watch the events of the earth, to be mindful. When we see the Antichrist, you know, come to be, to be revealed, we ought to be aware. Hey, we're a time of tribulation. We, you know, we need to get the, the preaching of God's, uh, uh, of, of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God out there to all nations. We need to be watching. We need to be prepared, ready, you know, to serve the Lord at the hardest times. This church had stopped watching. Okay, this church had stopped watching. And he said, look, because you're not watching, I will come upon thee as a thief. Now, keep your finger there and go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. And, uh, you know, our brethren, that I love very much, okay, I love them very much, that believe in a pre-trib rapture, they believe that Jesus Christ is coming upon them as a thief, all right? That's what the situation the church in Sardis is in. Jesus says, look, I'm going to come upon you as a thief. This is a negative thing, all right? This, this is not how it should be. They've stopped watching, and Jesus says, Jesus says I'm going to come as a thief to you. That's what our pre-tribulation brethren say about the Lord's return. They say, we don't know when it's coming. It's going to come as a thief in the night. Well, you've stopped watching, haven't you? You're in the same place as this church inside us. But they say it with conviction. They say it as a positive thing. No, it's a negative thing when you don't know when the thief is coming. Okay? They've stopped watching. You know, this church had turned to the pre-trib rapture. Right? Let's have a look at it. Well, maybe not, but you know. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 5. What does Paul say to the Thessalonian church? But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Well, there it is. It's coming as a thief in the night. But look at this, verse number three. For when they shall say peace and safety. Hey, not you, Thessalonian church. Not you, believers. Not you, Christians that are watching Christ. No, when they, the unsaved world, say, no, uh, sorry, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, you bre are, you, are you saved? Are you my brother or sister in the Lord? Are you my brethren? Then this is for you, brethren. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Brethren, the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ, should not overtake you as a thief, because you're not in darkness. You're a brother. Jesus wants you to know. Don't you think he wants you to know? 
right? So we can do His works, you know, we can, we can get out there and be encouraged and be reminded the Lord is coming back. And then verse number, uh, verse number five, ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Hey, when does a thief come? He comes at night. He comes in darkness. You know, he, he doesn't want to be seen. He wants to break into our house and, and not be caught. But if we're not in darkness, if we're not of the night, the thief will never come upon us, right? The thief's not going to break in during the daytime because in the daytime, we can watch. All right? And that's the, that's the way we ought to be, spiritually speaking. When we talk about the coming of the Lord, we ought to be in the light. We ought to be in the daytime. We ought to be aware and seeing how, you know, this world is progressively becoming worse how we've seen the prophecies being fulfilled, you know, the, the developments that, that are coming, you know, it's definitely coming, you know, we're definitely, today we're one day closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're also a day closer to the coming of the Antichrist as well, you know. But then verse number, verse number six, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, okay? For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Hey, this doesn't sound good. The unbelieving world, they're sleeping in the night. The thief's going to break in one day and still, and, you know. And they're also compared as drunken, you know. They don't have their full senses alert. They're not fully awake. You know, they're not sober-minded. And this church here in Sardis had become just like the unbelieving world. They had stopped watching. Jesus says, look, I'm going to come upon you as a thief. Just the same way as the unbelieving world. You're not even prepared for me. You're not doing the works anymore. You're no longer aware, you're, you're, you're drunken, you're, you're in the darkness. You're not sober-minded is what's being said about, you know, about this church in Sardis. And guys, again, our circle, our independent fundamental Baptist brethren have been deceived. They're in darkness, they're drunken about this topic of the end times, Amen. you know, and, and they're not waiting for the coming of the Lord. It will come upon them as a thief because they've chosen not to be children of the light in the sense of, Bible prophecy, end times prophecy, okay? So this church had done something very similar. They had stopped watching uh, for the Lord and He's going to come upon them as a thief in the night. Let's go back to uh, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3. And uh, just a reminder that we ought to be a church that does preach on the end times, that does preach on the rapture, the coming of the Lord. You know, when I started this church, I had some advice from some people because they know I hold a different position on the end times. It's like, oh, you know, maybe don't even talk about the end times. <laughs> maybe don't teach on the rapture. Don't teach on, on the book of Revelation. You know, is that really the most important thing? Well, yes. Otherwise, you can become a dead church like this church inside us. You know, it's an important part of the church to be aware of end time events. Okay. Now, as we get to verses number four and five, You'll see a contrast uh, in verse number four, which is about our walk with the Lord. And verse number five is about our position before the Lord. I have preached on these things uh, many times, but again, we're reminded about this in the Bible. And just a reminder, guys, if you're saved, you are in a perfect position before the Lord. You know, you have no sin before the Lord. When the Lord looks upon you, he sees you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, your position before the Lord is perfect. He looks at your position is when he looks upon you in that new man, okay? The new man in you that's perfect without sin, okay? So never, I never want you to get the idea that, well, I'm not living right, therefore maybe I'm not saved. Well, is salvation about living right? Well, no, because if it was about living right, then it's a works-based gospel. You know, clean up your life. No, the gospel is a free gift given to us by the Lord God. And of course, we also have the other real, uh, realistic um, oh, realization that we also have to walk with the Lord. And your walk with the Lord can be failing. Your walk with the Lord could be in darkness, okay? This church had been in darkness to some extent. They weren't even watching for the coming of the Lord. Their relationship, their fellowship with the Lord wasn't where it should have been. So we see this uh, comparison here in verse number four, which is about the walk with the Lord, and verse number five, about your position with the Lord. Let's look at verse number four. Thou hast a few names even inside us, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk, there's the walk, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, for they are worthy. So he says, look, this Sardis church, you're pretty much dead, all right? But there are a few people in your church. Praise God Amen. for a few people in the church, right? That his, Jesus says, look, they have not defiled their garments. They're still walking with me. They're still in fellowship with me. 
They're still walking in my ways. They've not defiled their garments, for they are worthy, he says. They're worthy of the relationship. They're worthy of the walk with the Lord. And what, as I'm thinking about this, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, thank God for New Life Baptist Church. You know, we're not a dead church, okay? We're, we're, we're doing the works of the Lord. We're teaching from His Word. You know, we put the Lord God first. But, you know, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the future, situations. Our children grow up. You know, people move places. You know, things happen, things develop, and, and you might find yourself, or even in the past, you've not had this church. You know, you've tried other churches, and you said, well, this church has the right gospel, you know, but they're dead. They're not doing the works of the Lord. And, and maybe, maybe in your mind, you feel like maybe the Lord's already removed the candlestick of that church. Hey, churches can get pretty bad. If you're looking at the book of Revelation, churches can get really bad and still be a candlestick unto the Lord. You know, again, it's just showing us the, 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 the long suffering of Jesus Christ and, and you know, the, the space He gives us of repentance to make sure that we improve as a church. But the point I want to say this is Jesus Christ wants you in His church. Okay? He died for the church. He purchased the church with His own blood. And if all you've got is a dead church. You, you know, I, I, I know, I've you know, obviously spoken to some of you guys, right? And you're like, well, man, that's a bad, that's a dead church. I, I'd just rather not be there. You know, and I understand. I, I understand how you feel about that. But did you notice that this dead church had a few righteous people? A few people that were faithful unto the Lord? And the Lord, even though He sees the dead church and He recognizes their condition, He goes beyond that and sees the faithful that are still in attendance. The faithful that are still trying to do the works of God. Okay? And what I want to say to you guys is this. I never want to see you outside of church. I never want to see you leave church. Okay? And I'm not even talking about New Life Baptist Church. I mean, I, I'd never want to see you leave New Life Baptist Church. But look, life happens. You know, things change. You know? Um, life. <laughs> if you're not seeing how life can lead you from one place to another, you know, I never thought I'd be on the Sunshine Coast. And I never thought I'd be here in Queensland. But things can develop and you know, you need to find the best church you can be in. The Lord wants you to be in church. When you're out of church, you're in disobedience. When you're out of church, you're committing sin. Okay? And sometimes we can be so righteous, say, well, this church is not up to my standard. It's not up to my level. I'm not getting anything out of this church, so I'm not going to be in that church. That's, look, you're, 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 you're not right with God if that's your approach. You're better off even in a dead church where Christ can look and say, well, you're worthy. You're worthy. I see that you haven't, you know, uh, you know um, what did you say there? You haven't defiled your garments. You're still walking with me. I mean, how much, what a beautiful thing for you to be in a bad church. I mean, hopefully it's a, it's a real church, you know, has the right gospel, you know, but in a bad church, but you're doing the best you can. Okay, your pastor might be failing you. The people around you, your brothers and sisters might be failing you. You know, they might not want to have to even talk about the Lord God. They'd rather talk about worldly things and, you're like getting frustrated. You're getting, I want to talk about the Lord. I want to grow in the Lord. I want to find fellowship with the Lord. But it might be the only church you've got. Then stick by that church. You know, show the pastor you've got their back. You know, maybe if you just show them some support. Say, look, pastor, I want to hear hard preaching. I've got your back. All right. I'm not going to be offended if you stand up and just boldly proclaim the word of God. I'm not going to be offended if you just go back to the old ways you used to be. You know, how many churches today, you know, in Australia are, are deteriorating? You know, uh, uh, moving away from preaching, uh, uh, you know, hard things. Uh, they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to get in trouble by the government. They don't want to be in trouble. They don't want to lose members, you know. Sometimes the, the preacher just needs your encouragement. So just preach it, brother. All right, even if you rip my face, even if you offend me, even if you step on my toes, I'd rather you just preach it so we can be right with God, you know, so we can be a church that, that's shining brightly, that, that, that lamp. You know, that the entire church can be walking after the ways of the Lord. I don't care if you offend me. That's how you should be. But again, just a reminder, even a bad church, please don't, don't thumb your nose. Look, it, a lot of dead churches could still be on that candlestick, all right? And the Lord's just giving them time to repent. You know, and if that's all you've got, you might be that little flame that gets that church back up to where it used to be. You know, it might take your work. It might take your encouragement, you know, your influence to get that church back to, you know, that flaming fire that it needed to be. And, you know, sometimes if you give up on churches, you know, you can be part of causing that church to, you know, lose its place as a candlestick. Um, so, yeah, just, just keep that in mind. I, I understand, you know, not liking watered-down preaching. I can understand not liking, 
Zionism, the teachings and the dispensational things sometimes, but if they're a church of God, if, if they're your brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know, the Lord might just be giving that church time to repent. You might be the deciding factor. You might be the one that the Lord's using, the one that's working, walking worthily of Him that will use that church to, to um, you know, be fired up. You know, I might, I might be a pastor that, that gets cast down. You know, I've got emotion, emotions and feelings and, you know, I can get sad. I can get a little bit distant from the Lord. I might just need a brother here or a sister to just encourage me, you know? And that's how we ought to be uh, toward one another. But let's look at verse number, let's look at verse number four again. It talks about here about walking with the Lord. So it's our, it's our walk with the Lord and you can defile your garments, okay? So as you have fellowship with the Lord, as you're walking with the Lord, if you're committing sin, if you're in darkness, you're, you're, you're going after worldliness and uh, you're, you're defiling those garments that you have, okay? You're defiling those garments and you, you wouldn't, you're not worthy of walking with the Lord in that situation, okay? And that's why it's so important for you to just bow your knees, bow your head, and just confess your sins to the Lord God, okay? That's what the Lord wants from you. When you've committed sin, just, just go to the Lord, confess those sins unto Him, He will forgive you, and you'll have those clean garments once again. You better walk with Him in fellowship, okay? But I just want you to notice that it said there, I uh, talked about there being, you know, being worthy. And uh, if you can take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I just want to touch upon the Lord's Supper just very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians 11 verse 27. First Corinthians 11 verse 27. Again, this is about the Lord's Supper. And notice what it says here. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. All right, so we've done the Lord's Supper a few times as the church, and I've often said how, you know, being unworthy, for, first of all, how, how are we worthy? You've got to be saved, that's, that's given. But also, our walk with the Lord could be unworthy, okay? Our walk with the Lord could be in a state of unworthiness, so you'd rather not partake of the Lord's Supper if you're not walking with the Lord. And that's why we have a time of silent prayer. We have a time there, verse 28. What's the answer? Is the answer just not to participate of the Lord's Supper? Well, if you're so prideful that you can't confess your sins, then yeah, you shouldn't participate of it. But verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So if you just spend time to examine yourself, make yourself worthy before the Lord in your spiritual walk, confess your sins, you know, put them before the Lord, and partic participate of the Lord's Supper, then you'll be worthy because you're worthy in your walk as well. Okay. So just keep that in mind with the Lord's Supper, not just worthy in salvation, but worthy to participate in the walk of the Lord with sharing the Lord's Supper. All right, now, um, verse number five, verse number five. So we looked at the walk, right? We looked at the walk that we ought to have. Now, verse number five is our position before the Lord. It says, he that overcometh, right, who's he that overcometh? For he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're saved, if you believe on Christ, you have overcome, you are saved. But look at this. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. Okay? So you see the two garments there? The garment of your white raiment because you've overcome, because you've believed. That's your position. It's always white. It's always a white raiment. But then you have your garment of your walk, and that can be defiled. That can be corrupted by your daily uh, life of sin. So you need to make sure, you know... The, you know, number one, that you have the white raiment of salvation, but number two, that you, when you walk with the Lord, that you keep that garment clean, you keep confessing your sins to the Lord. He understands, He knows that you're going to commit sin, and uh, we ought, ought to, you know, turn from those sins. We ought to ask the Lord guidance to help us in that area, but when we do fail, we ought to bring that before the Lord. But then it says this, for those that have overcome, for those that are saved, He says, and I will not blot out His name out of the book of life, of course. You've got to have your name in the book of life in order to be permitted into heaven. And so, of course, if you're saved, you are going to enter into heaven. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Okay, so what an honor, you know, even this dead church. He says, well, at least you're saved. <laughs> at least you have the white raiment, you know. And uh, because of the fact that you're saved, I'm going to confess your name to uh, the father and to his holy angels or before the angels there. So can you please turn to Ephesians chapter 2, please? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 
verse 8. And of course, we're all very familiar with this passage. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. How are you saved? By the grace of God. How do we receive the grace of God? Through faith, right? By believing. And that not of yourselves. Hey, you can't save yourself. It is the gift of God. It's free. Praise God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, okay? So very clear that salvation, that white garment, okay, um, is that, um, that white raiment is not of works, okay? Not of works. That white raiment is uh, righteous because of the righteousness of Christ, okay? But look at verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, okay? So this passage is wonderful. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is about salvation, not of works, your position before God. But then verse number 10 talks about our walk with the Lord. We ought to walk in good works before the Lord. And of course, that's making sure we don't, uh, um, that we keep our garments unspotted, undefiled. Go to Ephesians, or Ephesians chapter 4 now, just a few chapters over. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I just want to just reinforce the fact that, you know, being worthy before the Lord is how we walk before the Lord, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, okay? See, we're, 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 we're compelled, guys, to, yes, rejoice in the fact that we're saved without works, okay, but we're compelled to, to walk worthy, of the works that God has given us to do, all right? We need to be a little bit balanced in our, in our, in our teaching. I mean, look, salvation is free, okay? It's a gift of God paid completely by Jesus Christ, okay? And sometimes our enemies or people that are, you know, contrary to us will say, well, what, what are you saying? You can just live however you want? No, we're not, you know, we shouldn't live how. well, you could live however you want, okay? If you want to be chastised by God, you want to be judged by God? Yeah, you can live however you want, but expect the chastisement that comes from the Heavenly Father, okay? But, hey, we should walk after the ways that God has asked. We ought to be worthy in our walk with the Lord, okay? So my challenge to you guys is, how is your walk? You know, are you walking worthily? Can you say to yourself that, you know what, this past week I've been walking worthy of the calling that God has asked me to do, doing the works that God has asked me to do, have you confessed your sins to the Lord? When's the last time you've done that? You know you sin every day. Do I have to tell you that? You, you know that. You know you sin every day. You know, even if it might not be in deed, but definitely in thought. You might be think, just thinking foolish things. Just thinking wicked things is a sin. Just not doing what is good is a sin. Okay? The sins of commission and the sins of mission. Hey, you, you are, you commit sins every day of your life. All right? Now, when's, just... Ask yourself, when's the last time you've confessed those sins to the Lord? Could be a week, right? Could be a month. I mean, think about that. If you haven't done it for a week, that means you've not been walking worthy of God with God for a week. Okay, you've been unworthy of His fellowship. You've been unworthy of that walk with the Lord. Please get in the habit, guys. This 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 was a a, a game changer for me when I realized I better confess my sins to the Lord on a regular basis. In fact, as soon as I sin, I ought to be like, Lord, I'm just so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm a fallen man. Woe is me, Lord. Please help me to overcome that sin in my life. Help me to maintain that walk that's worthy of your calling. Help me to do the works that God has asked me to do. I mean, look, if you want to be effective for the work of God, you're going to have to be someone that is ready to humble themselves and confess their sins before God. I mean, if, if you're not walking worthy of Him, you can understand how the works of the law that you want to do will be hindered. The effects, the, the productivity, the effectiveness of the work of God will be hindered in your life just because you've got spotted garments in your walk and you need to get them clean. All right? Now, it said in Ephesians 4, verse 1, how are we to walk worthy of their vocation? Verse number 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Listen, you might be someone that says, I am walking after the ways of the Lord. You know, I'm uncompromising in the words of God. But how's your relationship with your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? You know, are, are, you, are, you, being, are you being low and meek? 
You know, are you putting the brethren before you? Are you, are you edifying the brethren? Are you being long-suffering with the, your brothers and sisters in the Lord? How's your, how, you know, if, if someone wrongs you in church or says something wrong or forgets to greet you or something, how quickly are you to get upset? Or are you going to be long-suffering with your brethren? If you want to be worthy with the Lord, you've got to have these attributes. These are the attributes of God. This is how, how God is able to put up with this church here. Okay, because He is long-suffering with them. Okay, and we ought to be that way toward our brethren, forbearing one another in love, you know, endeavoring. You know, endeavoring means you're putting effort in, okay? You're, 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 you know, this is not something that's natural. You're, you're putting the, the effort in place, you're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You say, look, I'm trying hard to make sure that this church, my brethren, we have peace with one another. We're endeavoring to do that. If you're not doing that, then you're not walking worthy to, with the Lord. Okay, it's not just doing what God commands us in the Bible, which is important, you know, doing the works, but doing it with the right spirit, doing it with the right attitude, doing it with the right love and patience that you have for your brethren. Keep that in mind. Back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 6. Revelation chapter 3, verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, so this church... Not the greatest, right? Sardis, not great. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants us to hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. The Holy Spirit wants us to know this, okay? Obviously, the Lord does not want us to get to that point, okay, of, of being a dead church, okay? This is why we have these examples for us in the Bible. So we need to take heed, we need to listen. Again, just a final reminder, guys, if you find yourself in a dead church, please be a blessing to them. Be a blessing to the brethren, be a blessing to your pastor. Be that one that is walking worthy of the Lord's calling. Be that one. You might be that only one that's keeping that church alive to some extent, okay? It might be that only one that brings, that resurrects that church. Please don't be, you know, don't hate other churches. You know, don't be, don't speak evil of other churches. I'm, I'm not talking about false churches. I'm not talking about those that have a false gospel. I'm talking about our brethren that's out there, Okay? And, you know, sometimes we say, well, they're not preaching the way they should. That's probably true. You know, they're not doing the works that they probably should. That's true. But you know what? We're probably not that perfect, okay? We, we, I'm sure we have things we can improve on. I'm sure there are things that the Lord has been long-suffering toward us, you know? And, you know, we ought to be mindful about the brothers and sisters that we have in the churches. Pre-trib, well, they're not watching. They're in the darkness, Okay. Hey, but the Lord might be just working with them, you know, you know, causing them to repent from those kinds of things, you know, still working with them, giving them space. You know, we need to be careful about how we talk about our, our, our brothers and sisters in the Lord and the other churches that God has, the other candlesticks. You know, I would hate for us to be doing everything perfect in this church, but the Lord says, I've got a problem with you guys by the way you see other churches. That'd, that'd be disappointing to me because we ought to be striving to be long-suffering and loving to our brothers, even if they're not part of this church. All right, so let's leave it there and let's pray.